Hello, Minnesota, and happy summer. Welcome back. I'm Tony Hernandez. This is your show, The Tony Hernandez Show. Today is Saturday, June 29th. Uh, we're going to have a great show. Jake is uh, rejoining us here at the show, and we're also going to be talking to Nancy Fulmick. Uh, we're going to be talking about our weight loss competition, successes and failures and, and everything in between. But uh, before we get into the main part of our show, I wanted to uh, give honor and respect to Mr. Vince Flynn and the Flynn family. Uh, Vince is a world-famous author uh, right from right here in Minnesota. He's born and raised in St. Paul. And uh, Dallas, if we could pull up uh, the uh, screen here and uh, show a picture of Vince, and this is his website. But yeah, he wrote uh, a number of books uh, that became uh, bestsellers. And anyone who's read Vince Flynn's books, uh, love him as an author. He's a great storyteller. And uh, his uh, memorial mass was at the St. Paul Cathedral. And I guess there's just the who's who of, of Minnesota were there. And a lot of people giving their respect and appreciation to uh, Vince Flynn. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring on our, our first guest. It's uh, Ms. Nancy Fomick. Uh, Nancy, welcome uh, to the Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I must say, that when, when I first saw your name, I thought it was Nancy, but right. it's, it's actually spelled N-A-N-C-I, and, and Correct. it's pronounced Nancy. Well, my friends call me Nancy, so technically it was Nancy, but then you always got to say Nancy with an I, Nancy with an I. And actually, um, being born in Italy, my dad was a uh, in the military and uh, all the Italians was like non chi like that's not right Nance I and then it just stuck in my whole life everybody thought they'd be funny and call me Nance I and so I just go by that now so. and so stay We're so good to... good and, and Jake uh, it's uh, it's good to have you back in the show Thanks, I didn't Tony. see you uh, last week but you know I must say you're you're, you're looking a little trim Am and I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we remember two weeks ago for everyone watching we started our biggest loser competition and not loser personality wise but we're talking about <laughs> loser uh, in terms of weight and so jake and i are going to be doing this competition for another 12 weeks right. and the the biggest loser is actually the biggest winner and the biggest loser of the biggest loser contest has to uh, donate uh, a nice donation to a, a, a not-for-profit of their choice and uh, Jake, you want to talk about what happened uh, behind the scenes here before we <laughs> started our live broadcast? Well, here. we didn't talk about last week's weigh-in, too. So last week I dropped, uh, what was it, eight pounds, and you dropped two. So I was winner week one. You had to put the $20 in the pot. And then this week uh, I dropped four pounds from last week, and your wonderful host here put on another two pounds. So once again, Tony's got the $40 <laughs> in the pot. That's getting ready and to be steered towards my charity of choice, Little Hearts Foundation. Well, like I said, I, I need the tax write off, and you uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, looking at least to the bright side of things. But I have to say that Jake was actually in my living room at 5:30 or 5:15 a.m. Uh, last Friday yeah. with his scale. It was the same night that it was pouring out, and we were planning on going on, on, on this run, and we actually ended up not doing that. It was a smart uh, choice not to go on that run. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little bit, uh, I've never seen you that early in the morning. So yes. you looked a little more bright eyed than, than I have. Well, and you know, it's not like you probably put on net weight. I mean, we did a weigh on it first thing in the morning, so you are probably your lightest during the day at that point, maybe. Uh, uh, other than having a workout, you know, where you lose a lot of water weight, that morning weigh-in is usually pretty favorable. Mm -hmm. And I got, you know, I got plenty of excuses as to why I haven't been able to uh, really ri ride the wave yet to my weight loss. And, you know, I got every excuse in the book. Everybody's got excuses. Uh, empathy weight, you know, okay. my wife being pregnant and, you know, I just have to be there with her eating ice cream and junk food. And not Leona, though. I'm actually eating the <laughs> junk food for her. So oh, yeah. keeping her trim and healthy and everything. God. You know, work. Is the stress at work and uh, you know just it makes me want to eat it makes me want to work out less and uh, but I, I still believe that I can win this thing uh, but I do think you were cheating though and I will say that well I don't know first day Jake you know two weeks ago comes in looking extremely obese and overweight that didn't he's happen. got a beard <laughs> down to here his afro he tells me how he was eating uh, three or four pieces of lasagna the night before and, and drinking uh, drinking beers the night before. So I think you had a lot more to shed in the immediate than I would. He say to that. Well, I guess uh, sure I did 
did eat a lot the night before, but it's not like you didn't know about the weigh-in. I guess cheating to Tony is I actually get up at 5 in the morning and go work out, go for a 40-mile bike ride or go for a 6-mile run. And I guess cheating to Tony is uh, eating very proportioned meals and not eating past 7 o'clock. I guess that's cheating to Tony. I call that just smart <laughs> way of losing weight. Well, we brought Nancy on because she is a... Uh, uh, C explain a little more about your credentials and... Well, to start off with, <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> um, I actually work as a weight loss coach. I actually originally um, had a lot of weight to lose. This is actually me before, if you can see. Can we get a picture? Yeah, we can see it pretty good there. So this um, is you how long ago? This is me before. This is actually a couple years ago. And uh, I actually uh, went from a, well, if you can see, a bulging out of a size 14. How's that? Uh, so bulging out of a size 14, isn't that awful? Put this actually on TV. <laughs> I would never do that. But. So bulging out of a size 14, uh, down to a size 6, uh, losing a total of 50 pounds. So that was pretty Amazing. awesome. Keep that off. So, so if I can do it, Tony can do it. Both of you can do well, it. Well, let's I talk know. a bit. Let's, let's talk, talk a little more. Tony. Like, did you have like it? Was there like a, an epiphany moment or an aha moment where you decided that you were gonna just do it? Well. When you go up that one more size, you're like, I am not buying that next size up, which is why it's hanging over the side. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Refuse to go to that next level. And so, um, yeah, so just, you know, make that happen. And so I joined the weight loss challenge that we actually do mm -hmm. and um, just learned everything. It's an eight-week course. Mm -hmm. You just learn exactly tips, healthy ways to, you know, lose the weight healthy but keep it off. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, people have been talking about America and how we have a, a weight problem mm -hmm. here, obesity mm -hmm. problem here. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Um, actually, uh, statistics have actually shown that uh, seven out of ten adults are actually <laughs> overweight. And you could, I mean, look around. Who do you know that needs to lose thirty pounds? Like everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, you brought you brought up right. how you noticed you were always going up in size, and right. I'd imagine right. there's uh, probably a lot of people up there who can, you know, as their years progress, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. maybe they were at a, a 30 waist, then a 32 if you're a guy, and then right. 34, mm -hmm. and right. 36. And you're like, and 30. what's going on? And then there's got to be some right. point where it mm -hmm. kind of caps off or hits right. the right. the ceiling. I actually had a friend of mine, uh, she actually was working out. That's all she did, work out short for the entire year. Mm -hmm. And she lost 15 pounds that year. Um, then got introduced to our weight loss challenge. She actually lost 15 pounds her first month, or the, the eight weeks of the weight loss challenge. So instead of a whole year, just mm -hmm. learning, you know, better eating habits and whatnot too, she actually was able to lose the weight faster. And she's lost a total of 50 pounds now. Mm. So, Jake, have you found that uh, that you've gone up in size and in, in terms of your waist and, and neck and, and head size as well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> my neck doesn't ever seem to expand, but. Uh, you know, my eye opener as far as clothes go is uh, my suits are starting not to fit, you know. Now they fit all right, but, you know, that was like, oh, that's, that's, yeah. that's pretty expensive, you know. Two, right. Let's say a low end of $200 suit, that's a big cost for me to go buy a couple more suits. So I'd rather just drop oh, yeah. those pounds and right. fit back into those. Oh, yeah. You notice it, like, right here. Oh, yeah. And then a couple times, like, I've put shirts on before that, you know, all of a sudden they don't button as tight, like as loosely right. as they used to, and y you think that maybe it went through the dryer too long or something, and then, then you realize. Us girls say that all the time. Oh, it shrank in the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> well, they all did. Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> so can you talk a little more about what you did uh, to lose the weight, and then sure. also how were you able to keep it off? Because I think a lot of people right. are able to lose weight in the immediate, you know, they right. cut something, but then right. they always right. go back. Right, that's so one of the things that we teach in our weight loss challenge is, um, you know, we talked about this earlier, you know, just hitting your calorie number, knowing exactly mm -hmm. what your calorie number is. And everybody's number is different. Mm -hmm. That's the key. So finding out, like we did your shape scan mm -hmm. with you, so mm -hmm. make sure that you knew exactly how many calories your body burns. Because just because you're the same, let's say you guys both, let's say you're the same height and the same weight. We're okay? not, though. We're not. But let's say you were. You would totally have <laughs> two different calorie numbers, you know, because you have more muscle, right, from lifting that, weights. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it would make a difference because it would be you're burning more calories right. if you have more muscle mass. So that way you know exactly how many calories. It's not like a weight measurement chart, whatever. It's exactly. And you also finding out how much protein your body needs to help keep that muscle mass. Very important. If you have enough muscle, as you know, you mm -hmm. burn more calories. Yeah. So that's the that's key to having those two numbers figured out. So we do that. So you talked about like the, the protein and the carbohydrates. And how does that play into your metabolism? 
Well, actually having enough protein actually is going to one of the things that helps your body to burn more calories. So keep the calorie in range, so you cut your calories, but not too low. If you go too low, then your body goes into starvation mode. So it's, it's key to make sure you have the appropriate number. Because if you lose too little calories, you actually lose muscle mass too. Mm -hmm, right. And that's not good. Right. Because mm -hmm. then it slows your metabolism down. People, you'll hear people all the time that get to a certain age, like, oh, I can't lose weight because I'm old. No, it's, it's years of not having the right nutrition right. that your body actually, your metabolism goes down from that. So, so yeah. what do you think about the, the people who do the types of diets, like the, the no-carbohydrate diet, where they're, they're at the burger shop and they're only eating the burger and right. they're eating lots of nuts? And, and but that's great until you eat any carbs, and then your body goes, ooh, carbs! <laughs> <laughs> So there's a balance. You gotta. I mean, you should have carbs. Now, too many obviously is not the right number either. There's a there's a balance that you want to stay at, and so. And are there yeah. particular kinds of carbs you stay away from, like? Uh, well, obviously the refined sugars. Exactly. Is, yeah. You know, we all know that. But you know, sticking to your your good your good complex carbs. What do you mean by refined sugars? I don't and, think everybody everybody does know about that. Well, just say this: stick mm -hmm. to the the good healthy, you know, your fruits and vegetables, your your lean meats and. Stick away, stay away from gushers. Yeah, and candy I don't know bars how the anything in the what fast food and gas station. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good point. <laughs> so don't eat anything at fast food or the gas station. Unless you own one, of course. You know you want to promote your business, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Hmm. And so, do you have any uh, any advice for for people out there who maybe are on the fence? Because you know what I've found is is to get to that point where you can make the decision mm -hmm. that you're going to that you're going to do it mm -hmm. that you're going to you know change your diet right. that you're going to increase right. your activity and how, how do you get people to to make that decision That's totally you know like you guys did you hit a point where you're mm -hmm. like okay I got to do something mm -hmm. I can't I mean there's nothing I can do that makes people make that decision but once somebody's made that decision like great now let's teach you exactly what you need to do to make those goals happen so and then the key is, too, if you do it properly, like we teach in our weight loss challenges, then it's easier to do because you actually know what you're mm -hmm. doing and you're keeping the weight off, too. So that's, that's the key. Because if you just say, yeah, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to do it now, that's great. But if you're doing it the wrong way, you know, sometimes people eat, you, there was something I saw at the store the other day, high-protein pretzels. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so if you run out, let's say a high protein, low carb diet, you would say, "Oh, I could eat this." Yeah. But then you're like, "No, you can't eat high. That, that's ridiculous." You know, it's one gram more of protein than do, regular pretzels. That's not really high protein. Do you <laughs> encourage a crash meal uh, once a week or a crash day or something like that? A crash day? Actually, I don't don't encourage that. Okay. But. If you hit your, what does that mean? If you hit your, well, what I've I've done because my, my weight in since I graduated from college has kind of been like this, you know, um, and whenever I'm trying to cut weight again, I always have like that one day a week where it, rules are off, you know, and I can kind of eat a little bit more like I do when I'm not at a good weight, or have one meal a week where I say pasta and breadsticks, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and you know. Just be careful on those too, because let's say you, let's say you had that philosophy, right? right? Now some people be like, today is a free for all. We can actually we actually show how if you went out to a restaurant and you just ordered an appetizer, a regular meal, and you split a dessert, let's say, and it's it's so many calories and mm -hmm. just that that you've actually gained everything that you've lost over the week, yeah. and it's like okay, that's not going to help you reach. any way lost. Just from uh, so just from one time one, one going time. out. Hmm. Isn't that scary? It is. It is. You would think, oh, it's just it's just a half an appetizer, half a piece of cake. Twenty five hundred calories later. <laughs> well, it kind of it kind of plays on that that theory of you hear this from people who smoke cigarettes or maybe who's somebody who's trying to quit drinking mm -hmm. is they're like, this is my last cigarette yep. ever, right. or this is the last pack of cigarettes mm -hmm. that I'm ever going to buy, or mm -hmm. this is the last time I'm ever going to go gambling, or you know, fill in the yep. blank with whatever it is yep. that that person, and, and it seems like. That mentality right. doesn't necessarily work, so maybe the but we do, one day a week thing is kind it's of it's a little the same too much. Thing. But we yeah. do say, like, you know, if it's your birthday, go for it. Have a piece of cake. It mm -hmm. is your birthday. Right. But we always we have a joke um, that we always talk about. We say it's a holiday, not a holiday week, or <laughs> a holiday like month, <laughs> or a holiday year. Yeah. It's a holiday. So you know, obviously, you know, have fun on that day. Yeah. You know, go for it. But 
it's just one day and right. then go back to you know where you're on track so, mm -hmm. so yeah have fun yeah. live life that's right but not every week yeah <laughs> So do you, any, uh, you, you coach Tony. I think I'm still going to have my uh, crash meal. Uh, it, it's always worked for me, but I, I know some people will have that crash meal. Wait, you just said just it's always worked for you, but then you described your weight going when, up and when down, I'm, up when and I'm, down. No, no, That's a very I, good point. Well, what I mean is when I'm doing a weight loss thing, the reason I go up and down is my big problem is I will uh, feel like I've reached a good weight, and then I'll just completely forget about the eating part. I'm always working out. I just forget about the eating part, and then uh, I get back to bad habits. But when I'm in that good eating habit, um, I usually give myself at least a meal, if not a, a day of, you know, crap, you know. <laughs> You're gonna win. <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. He may be Curse in the thing, lead, if, but if you're out there, start making this guy lasagna <laughs> and beer and uh, feed him after seven o'clock p.m. and and uh, uh, and maybe get uh, <laughs> pregnant so he can gain empathy weight too. <laughs> So, Densai, can you talk about your um, your your business and helping people? Sure. Like, how do you how do people find you? And, and yep. So we do uh, weight loss challenges actually all over the Twin Cities. Um, we just actually ended one just recently. It was my numbers on here? We just actually our group of people participants lost two hundred and twenty four pounds, point eight pounds mm. as a group, which is mm. awesome. That's a person. That's that's more than a person. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that was a person a at the first <laughs> <laughs> Um And so we actually paid out eight hundred and what is it, twenty five dollars cash wow. to the winners. So yeah. in the same kind of way, we did it percentage wise, like you guys are doing, because that's fair. Whether yeah. you, you have right. a guy versus a girl, yep. or um, someone has a lot of weight to lose, or just a little bit to lose, it's, it makes it fair in the percentages. Do you do too, it the so. same way that that uh, Jake? Cherry picked his rule so that uh, he was going to try to guarantee his win. Where do you start with the weight at the beginning, or do you change it every no, every we, week? No, we do. Uh, it's from the very first weigh-in to the very last weigh-in at eight weeks is the final numbers are. But we do weekly weigh-ins to help keep it. Is that is that what we're doing? Well, yeah, yeah, what Tony and I are doing is Jake. Well, you like should work a, at the IRS. It is the, by the, the way. final. All these yeah, complicated kind of rules gets my, uh, my principles, but. Uh, <laughs> The way that we're doing it is we're having a weekly weigh-in mm -hmm. uh, to get the money in the pot. Right. So the person with the most or the least amount percentage weight loss uh, loses and puts the $20 right. in. Yep. Um, and then at the end, uh, whoever's got the largest percentage weight loss gets to direct where those funds go to, their mm -hmm. charity of choice. The one thing that Tony doesn't like is... We're not going to play, we're not going to have any gameplay where like one week you just cut a bunch of water weight um, and so then the next week you take it easy, you know, that kind of gameplay mm -hmm, they do on mm -hmm, that show Biggest mm -hmm. Loser. So our point is you take, uh, uh, if you put on another two pounds like you did this week, we still got to use that 210, so it's the lowest weight that he weighed in. So you really hurt yourself if you go back up in weight. Right, right. And we actually do that in our challenge too. If you, if you, oh, if you lost, a let's say you gained a pound, you have to pay a dollar hmm. because... No. See, I'm not even that harsh on you. We don't, we don't want to, <laughs> but it's just, it's just, it's more or less to help you, um, if you're, say you're at, a, you're at work, somebody brings in donuts, and you're like, mm, well, one donut won't hurt, and you're like, wait, I got to pay a dollar, I'm not going to do that, do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. just, it's just a little incentive, because we don't really need the money, it just, it's just the, you know, to help you, you, you keep focusing, and focus on it too, so. Mm. There, I've always seen there is sometimes a little bit of a plateau or leveling off during a weight loss uh, portion. I mean, you see that, don't you? Do you have to change if up eating habits? people do, uh, well, one, if you people aren't doing it right, you know, that can, that can definitely play. Because sometimes you lose a lot of water or whatever, but if you're not mm -hmm. actually losing fat, or people exercise a lot and they're not eating enough protein, they can lose muscle mass, and that mm -hmm. will throw things off too. But sometimes people, you know, you're going to lose body fat, but maybe you're working out, you're eating yep. your protein, you're um, gaining muscle mass, so the scale may not show. So one of the things that we can do is take inches too. Because I went from a size 12 to an 8 in five okay. weeks. Shrink. Nice. So it's all about the inches, in our, in my opinion, it's. But you still use the weight as the final thing on the right. competition for the competition yeah. to make it even, because you know how you take your inches or whatever can be right. different too. My philosophy is I don't care if I weigh a thousand pounds if I fit into a size four. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, I, I, I personally wouldn't mind keeping the size. I'd just like to turn that fat into pure raw muscle. You know, That's right. so. Grr. Good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> Nancy, Nancy, before, uh, before you leave, can you just tell everybody how they can uh, get a hold of you if they'd Absolutely. like? Absolutely. So uh, my phone number is 
646-649-4646. And if anybody has um, a weight loss challenge they'd like to start at their church or work or whatever, we can come in and do that too. So about 40 participants makes the jackpot a $1,000 a winning. So mm, Great. Well, Nancy, thanks for uh, okay. sharing uh, all your wisdom and Thank encouraging you. us here on our uh, greatest or uh, biggest loser <laughs> challenge here. And uh, certainly appreciate you coming on the show and We're hopefully gonna make it you can happen. come again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to uh, change gears here a little bit. On uh, July 20th, we're going to have a, a, a great guest. We're really excited to have him on. He's a gubernatorial candidate. He's trying to unseat Governor Mark Dayton. He's a Republican seeking Republican endorsement. His name is Jeff Johnson. And uh, we're going to uh, play a, a little bit of his uh, video from his announcement. And this kind of goes over just some of the highlights of uh, his announcement. Uh, I believe it was around a month ago. Uh, but we look forward to having uh, Jeff on the show on July 20th. I'm Jeff Johnson, and I'm here today to announce with great excitement and great humility that I'm running for governor of the wonderful state of Minnesota. We will make Minnesota the best place in the upper Midwest to start a business, large or small, and we are not just going to roll over for South Dakota or Wisconsin anymore in this state. Enough hand-wringing about the achievement gap we have to take whatever actions are necessary to allow every parent in this state to send their kid to a great school. Not just some parents, not most parents, but every single parent in the state of Minnesota. As your governor, on my very first day, I'm going to start the process of a four-year, line-by-line, top-to-bottom audit of every single program that Minnesota taxpayers fund, starting with our human services programs. And the ones that can prove to us that can actually prove to us they change people's lives for the better, we will celebrate them and we will bolster them. And the ones that can't, we're going to end once and for all. Let's make government work. And so we need a candidate who is a reliable, principled conservative and thereby can be endorsed and supported by our activist base. But we also need someone who is liked enough and trusted enough by non-Republicans and who can actually relate to the vast middle class in this state so that they're able to win a statewide election. And I was able to take common sense, free market, conservative ideas and turn them into law. Not just talk about them, not just get headlines, but action and results. Among other things, I was the successful chief author of bills to pass the most significant lawsuit reform we'd seen in Minnesota in decades, to cut the capital gains tax rate, to pass the most comprehensive anti-meth legislation that had ever been passed in this country at that time, and to dramatically restrict the power of government to take our property through eminent domain. So here's an idea. If you think something's good for Minnesota, vote yes. If you think something's bad for Minnesota, vote no and stop screwing around with people's lives and money. It's not a game. Our future lies in recognizing that the greatness of Minnesota does not come from our government. It comes from the creativity and innovation and work ethic of every single individual in this state. That's where our future lies. But make no mistake, if I'm your governor, that's the direction we'll be headed and we will get there. Join me in getting that done and thank you all for being here. So that's uh, Jeff Johnson for Minnesota Governor. Again, he's going to be on the show on July 20th. Uh, we look forward to having him on and hearing more about his uh, vision for Minnesota, especially, Jake, because this is at a time of great crossroads, not only here in our state, but our country. Uh, many people know that on July 1st, uh, a lot of the uh, taxes that were passed under the Dayton administration, under the Democrat leadership in the State House and State Senate, they're starting to go into effect on July 1st. This includes a, a tax increase on cigarettes of $1.40 per pack. I'm not a smoker. Right. Um, you know, I don't condone smoking, don't think it's healthy. Uh, however, you know, it seems a bit unfair for people who are smokers uh, to have to see their uh, packs of cigarettes increase so much and it's just going to drive business to the area states. And, and it also usually affects people of lower income classes too, the people that generally are the higher frequency of smokers. That, yeah, that, and it, you're right. If you're making, you know, if you're working, if you're a banker making uh, $200,000 a year and you're smoking, you know, if you pay five or 10 bucks per pack, but if you're on a, a limited income making 10 to $30,000 right. a year, absolutely, that that's going to cut into your uh, cut into your income pretty and, fast. And the DFL's rationale is by taxing it more you de-incentivize people to smoke. So if you tax to try to get rid of a behavior then isn't the same thing going to apply to the income tax increase that they've done. If you tax them more in income isn't that going to de-incentivize them 
to uh, find more ways of producing income. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And another tax that's uh, coming onto the dockets on July 1st is the gift tax. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a little known tax that was slid in there. There was a little debate about the gift tax. Uh, we are now going to be one of two states in the entire uh, United States of America that, that are going to have a gift tax for uh, when people give gifts to each other. Now, granted, it's got to be at a million dollars plus over the lifetime. Right. Uh, but that's going to uh, impact people's behaviors. And there's already talk uh, about people who own estates that are scrambling to get their trusts reformatted mm -hmm. or they're doing what uh, Governor Dayton's family did and they're going to other states to open their their trusts and whatnot. And so this is definitely impacting uh, the behavior and the consequences right directly on Minnesotans. Yeah, and it's important to note the fact that this money was already taxed at some point, whether it was derived from income directly from work. So it was taxed at that point through your income taxes or it was earned in the stock market and you paid cap gains or you paid dividends on it uh, or income on the dividends. Either way, that was tax money. So once again, it's just another way of the DFL to double tax people and m take more money out of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another tax that's going into effect is there's going to be some type of an internet-based uh, tax. So when, when people in Minnesota, uh, young, old, rich, poor, when they're downloading stuff uh, off the internet, there's going to be uh, an additional tax on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Democrats passed a tax on paint uh, so essentially every time you buy uh, a can of paint now, are you going to be painting a, a room or are you going to be painting, uh, it's a 75 cents per gallon increase on uh, paint. Hmm. Um, that's going to impact, you know, whether people are going to be, you know, especially if you're buying hundreds of gallons of paint, you might right. go over to Wisconsin now to Sherwin-Williams across the, across the state lines or to Iowa or other places. And so uh, these, these taxes are, are all taken into effect and, uh, it doesn't seem to be very much calculated about how it's going to impact our economy, and I guess we're just going to have to wait and see how it does. But my feeling is it's probably not going to be pretty good. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you never know. Uh, it's definitely bad for the economy, but you don't know how much of an extent that is because um, there are m multiple things that uh, factor into a business making that decision to leave the state of Minnesota. And I know as a business owner, it's very difficult for me to leave the state because of family and we have wonderful natural resources here. I'm an outdoorsman, so it's very difficult for me to leave the state. Um, so w what's my echelon? I don't know, a 20, 30% tax increase before I take my uh, business and move to South Dakota. But some people, it's just that 2% increase that says that's enough, you know. Um, I need to leave this state. It's not. It's not working out for yeah. us anymore. And, and and also the businesses that would make a decision about moving here probably is going to stop that from happening. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And one of the arguments the big taxing uh, Democrats always use about Minnesota is, listen, compare Minnesota to the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the the amenities, we have the lakes, we have, you know, the beautiful landscape, the people. Um, you know, but I think as as the taxes begin to increase more and more and the effects begin to depress the economy here in Minnesota, you're going to see people moving. And then also, not to mention the people who do have mobility, who can move to Florida right. for six or seven months out of the year, so they don't even have to pay income taxes in Minnesota. That's right. You're going to see more and more of the rich people, uh, and I see them, talk to them every day. There's a, a whole grip load of people in St. Paul mm -hmm. that don't vote in St. Paul because they vote in, in Florida. Right. Because they live there seven months out of the year. And, and, you know, whether that's right or wrong, I've heard people say, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. That's, you know, they should be proud be, to be Minnesotans and pay taxes <laughs> here. But it gets to a point where people are taxed enough. That's right. And, and they can't do it anymore. And we are getting dangerously close to that point because it seems like anything and everything that can be taxed, whether it's your death or your life or your consumption or your internet use or, or whatever, they're, they're finding a way to do it. That's right. And, and double taxing, like I said, with a gift tax, you know, one t paying so a tax on one item once isn't good enough. I mean, look, look, here's a tax that we all have to deal with. A vehicle, brand new vehicle is taxed right off the bat, a sales tax on a vehicle, right? But every time you resell that vehicle, there's another sales tax. And that's just, it's like, how many times can one item be taxed? It's not... It's not right. 
Yeah, and you know something uh, something uh, is going to be done about this. You know whether it's uh, from somebody's intent or if it's just the consequences yeah. of these policies. And uh, you know we have Jeff Johnson coming on here. He's running for Minnesota governor. Uh, Scott Honor, he's another candidate who has uh, he announced a couple months ago mm -hmm. that he's running. Uh, just recently, we had former speaker uh, or, or not speaker, speaker former speaker of the, of the house. house. Kurt Zellers. Kurt Zellers. Yeah. Uh, he recently announced, and we have uh, State Senator Dave Thompson, right. who has recently announced. So we have four uh, pretty strong, I'd say, candidates uh, that are going to run against Governor Dayton. But Governor Dayton, there was just a poll that was done, and, and it was within Minnesota, and it was reported that he's got nearly a 60% a approval rating for the job that, that he's doing. So it yeah. appears that Governor Dayton is going to be uh, very difficult to defeat. Yeah, that you can't put much stock into that. You don't look at those things until mid-October to late October to really know where the election is going to fall. A lot can change, especially when they match him up against a candidate that has very low name ID, which um, I would say the majority of those candidates do. Kurt Zellers might be a little different because uh, being the Speaker of the House during the uh, Republican tenure, but... Other than that, and, and I guess Dave Thompson have some bit of name recognition around the state, but still not as much as Dayton. So no. I don't put a lot of stock None in None of those polls. guys have department stores behind them. <laughs> or trust funds in South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, something that uh, there's a congresswoman out there. She's a Democratic mm -hmm. congresswoman from, is she from Illinois? Her name is uh, Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth. I think she's Illinois, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, so she's a Democratic legislator. Uh, out of Illinois, and she, uh, you know, I just stumbled across this video. I don't know if it was on Facebook or somebody tweeted it out, uh, but I, I watched this and I was pretty amazed. And and to just give a backdrop of, of what this is, this is a congressional hearing, mm -hmm. and there is an IRS contractor, uh, also a, a veteran or was in the military at some point, and um, essentially he was caught red-handed. You know, I don't want to get into too many details because I don't know many of the details, but essentially he was getting caught red-handed, exaggerating his ankle injury, mm -hmm. which he really had a, a, it was a football injury that he had on the football field. But because he was going to a military academy. A prep school, a, right? Yeah. You know, so he linked the two together and was somehow able to yeah. uh, finagle his way into disability income. You know, and it was like, you know, I don't know how much he was getting every every month, but... Uh, so he had to testify, and I don't know why the the, poor, the guy had to, uh, but this is an IRS contractor, and he had to testify. And this congresswoman Duckworth, uh, she's uh, she's disabled, mm -hmm. and, and um, you know we'll talk more about her story after. She's full full disabled too, because she's got both uh, legs missing. So yeah, she rides disability. around in a in a in a wheelchair, and, right. and, and in the early part of the testimony, she was talking to the guy about how much pain she was in, right. and you know I think. Uh, you know, she almost lost her one of her arms too. But uh, yeah, she did. I think it was reattached. Yeah. yeah. So we'll uh, we'll go ahead. I, I got this lined up, and uh, we'll play this now. This is Congresswoman uh, Duckworth. And um, in fact, we thought we would lose my arm, and I'm still in danger of, of possibly losing my arm. I can't feel it. I can't feel my three fingers. My disability rating for that arm is twenty percent. In your letter to a government official. I think it's the SVA, um, attention Gina Mu, you said, my family and I have made considerable sacrifices for our country. My service-connected disability status should serve as a testimony to that end. I can't play with my kids because I can't walk without pain. I take twice daily pain medication so I can work a normal day's worth. These are crosses, these are crosses that I bear due to my service to our great country. And I would do it again to protect this great country. I'm so glad that you would be willing to play football in prep school again to protect this great country. Shame on you, Mr. Castillo. Shame on you. You may not have broken any laws. We're not sure yet. You did misrepresent to the SBA. But you certainly broke the trust of this great nation. You broke the trust of veterans. Iraq and Afghanistan veterans right now are waiting an average of 237 days for an initial disability rating. And it is because people like you who are gaming the system are adding to that backlog so that young men and women who are suffering from post-traumatic stress, who are missing limbs, cannot get the compensation and the help that they need. 
And I'm sure you paid through, pay, played through the pain of that foot all through college. Well, let me tell you something. I recovered with a young man, a Navy corpsman, who, while he was running into an ambush where the, his Marines were hurt, had his leg knocked off with an RPG. He put a tourniquet on himself and crawled forward. He is who played through the pain, Mr. Costello. You did not. You took advantage of your system. You described these status just today that other companies were using these special statuses as competitive weapons against you. You who never picked up a weapon in defense of this great nation, very cynically uh, took advantage of the system. You broke the faith with this nation. You broke the faith with the men and women who lie in hospitals right now at Walter Reed, in Bethesda, at uh, Brook Army Medical Center in Lanstu. You broke the faith with them. And if this nation stops funding veterans' health care and stops and calls into question why veterans reserve their benefits, it is because cases like you have poisoned the public's opinion on these programs. I hope that you think twice about the example that you're setting for your children. I hope that you think twice about what you are doing to the nation, to the, this nation's veterans who are willing to die to protect this nation. Twisting your ankle in prep school is not defending or serving this nation, Mr. Castillo. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I've gone, you've been very indulgent. I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentlelady and the time was well spent. So that, uh, that, that guy who was there probably didn't feel uh, too good after that uh, tongue lashing <laughs> right. from Congresswoman Duckworth. But um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I just thought it was, I thought that was kind of a telling video in a couple different ways because in America right now, we have a, a big problem with entitlements. Mm -hmm. I think something like 100 million households get some type of a federal check, you know, whether it's Social Security or disability, or whether it's food stamps, or whether it's some type of a pension or military pension or, or VA benefits. And I'm not saying that uh, most of these, the vast majority of these, maybe are, are very well deserved, uh, especially for the veterans who sacrifice so much for our country. Uh, we also have a problem in this country, though, of, of fraud mm -hmm. and people taking advantage of these systems because they look at it like it's free money, mm -hmm. like it, they have to go out there and they have to get their piece. And um, my feeling is sometimes, you know, with, with veterans, perhaps, is if you put veterans benefits in front of something, it's like you automatically get a pass for whatever is in the rest. And that's exactly what this guy got caught doing is, is he was talking about how he was a veteran and talking about how much he, he served his country when, it, when in fact he didn't. Right. What do you think about that as a veteran? Yeah, I mean, I, it kind of touches at home. When I got back from Iraq, I had a patellar ligament surgically repaired. Um, and uh, it, it's definitely the fall of the Army, but it's, it's like a sports-related injury, meaning, you know, from putting on a ruck, sack and in marching and stuff like that stress but it's nothing that you know enemy combat that that caused it and uh i i got put uh at fort lewis with a group of people uh who were coming back from tours of duty in iraq and afghanistan and and had some kind of uh, medical ailment and um you know i had to make the choice to uh to get out of there uh because i think it was wrong for a guy uh to be in a program like that that's just got a a, a medical or a, a, a very like sports related injury not that I shouldn't be healed and back to 100 percent duty you know to be an effective infantry soldier but uh, there are guys out there that are in wheelchairs and missing limbs and stuff that need that stuff so um, yeah I've seen I've seen people abuse that system firsthand uh, and it gave me a very sour taste but you know, there's also a lot of good out there and a lot of good programs like the Wounded Warrior uh, Foundation that helps those soldiers that are going through that and the families. So there, are, there is a silver lining to it as well. But Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, show this, this next clip, and I thought you'd get a kick out of it, Jake, because, you know, <laughs> it brings down, we were talking about, I don't think you were here for the show, but we were talking about how uh, a lot of these Democrats on a national level have, have changed sides, whether it's, uh, coming down on, on issues of war. Yep. You know, all of a sudden you have all these Democrat war hawks out there, people who were before saying that they wanted peace, uh, whether it's on government spying and surveillance. Mm -hmm. You know, you had people like Vice President Biden, who when he was U.S. Senator was coming down on the Bush administration for the NSA program that now the administration that he serves is is protecting. And 
and even President Obama has flip-flopped on oh, yeah, a large absolutely. number of issues, especially when it comes to civil liberties and the growth of government and, and the Fourth Amendment. And uh, somebody made this video here. It's actually uh, the YouTube channel Save the Fourth Amendment. And uh, essentially what it shows is candidate Obama debating President Obama. So debating himself, you know, granted it's candidate Obama, you know, six, seven years ago, derating the Bush administration sure. for, for their programs infringing on civil liberties. And, and then it compares to President Obama, who sounds very, very much like President Bush. So we'll play that right no now. More, no more promises, hope and change. The separation of powers works. Our Constitution works. We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers and that justice is not arbitrary. This administration acts like violating civil liberties is the way to enhance our security. It is not. There are no shortcuts to protecting America. But my assessment and my team's assessment uh, was that they help us prevent terrorist attacks. This administration also puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we provide. You can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and zero inconvenience. Uh, you know, they, they, we're we're going to have to make some choices. Uh, as a society. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. Hmm. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. No more ignoring the law when it is inconvenient. That is not who we are. And it's not what is necessary to defeat the terrorists. And uh, what I can say is, is that in evaluating these programs, they make a difference in our capacity to anticipate and prevent possible terrorist activity. In the abstract, you can complain about Big Brother and how this is uh, uh, a potential, uh, you know, you know, program run amok. But when you actually look at the details, then I think we've struck the right balance. So, yeah, the right balance is, you know, something that this uh, video, I think, struck pretty good, you know, showing some of the double talk and the double speak and, you know, do you agree, though, that when you, when you become president, everything changes? Yeah, I mean, I've, I think that's a logical conclusion some people draw. Like, you campaign and you don't see some of the data and the intelligence. And you get into office and you see the implementation of these programs. So, um, you know, that, that could explain why he's a hypocrite, because he is a hypocrite. Obviously, he's flip-flopped quite a bit on a lot of those campaign promises. But if I could give a message to Democrats, because this is really what separates like a Tea Party person or a libertarian uh, from, you know, the left and the right side of politics is that, you know, we just don't view a strong central government to be good at all. Um, rather that's for economic power, uh, large military power, uh, you know, invasion of privacy, uh, wiretapping, anything. We, we want that Constitution to be followed, which preserves those liberties that we have been given to from God. And uh, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that that's going to be abused on both sides of the aisle going forward because the Democrats tend to always think of government as a solution, big government, more centralized power is good. And Republicans uh, seem to completely forget about this arena when it comes to uh, war and, uh, and surveillance. And what do you think, Jake? Have you talked to many of your Democratic friends about these 
NSA spying violations of these civil liberties, uh, are they waking up at all? Are they starting to see the, the writing on the wall? Or, or do you think that most Democrats still uh, are, are looking at President Obama's presidency as, as the great change in hope that it was proclaimed to be? I think they get distracted by other issues like health care and uh, the gay marriage debate. And so um, when you throw up a little bit of candy here and there, you still feel like things are sweet. But uh, they, they kind of excuse that sourness of the uh, things that they used to be against, like the wars, which I, I don't know how that's swept under the rug. I mean, we're still fighting a war over a decade long, longest war we've ever been in. And there's really no good stated mission, no great objective going on in Afghanistan. And you could take it from me as a retired infantry officer that that's, that's not where we need to be. It's not helping our national security. It's not helping uh, our freedom, our liberty. It might be helping a certain people overseas, but I don't know if that's the best use of our resources. And that's used, that used to be a democratic talking point, and it doesn't seem to be anymore. It's no mystery to me that Obama wants a big war because that's the health of the state. But what about all these people that used to believe that war is bad and, and we're, we're all the peaceful protesters? Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with the civil liberties issues. The only ones I really hear making a lot of noise are from the ranks of the Libertarian Party or various uh, groups that focus on liberty like Tea Party or uh, the Ron Paul people in the Republican Party. And, you know, the, the um, anti-Wall Street people, the 99 percenters, I think they, they made a pretty loud noise, whether you agree with their philosophy or not, but they were getting out there and they were making some of the same protests and that Tea Partiers were or uh, other movements as well. Yeah, I mean, that 99 percent thing was, it was goofy. There was really no strong philosophy from that movement. Um, because we share a similar sentiment that this cronyism that takes place of uh, this crony capitalist culture, corporations buying votes and buying influence, the Fed uh, propping up banks and corporations uh, is a bad thing. But my solution to that is allow the free markets to exist. The 99% of percenters want more power to the government to redistribute wealth. So. They're a little inconsistent because they don't believe in economic liberty, but they believe in you know privacy and, and other liberties and civil liberties. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a Tea Party would party or would believe in economic liberty and civil liberty, privacy and those issues in, in totality. Once again, we don't really feel a central power, a central government on Washington is ever a good thing. Why why do most of our tax money go out to Washington D.C. to a bunch of bureaucrats? It should be staying local. Let's solve things on the most local level possible. That's really how the framework of our country was developed, is that we don't have a big central government. In fact, it's just an employee of the several states. The state should have the most power. And I think even Jefferson leaving office as president went back and said, man, the states even have too much power. It should be more at the local level, whether that's a county or city. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think... Um, I think there's a lot of inconsistency out there, but I welcome anyone to follow me on any one of those liberty issues. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, talking more about uh, the NSA thing, we haven't talked about uh, Snowden, you mm -hmm. and I. Yeah. Uh, the guy who made, uh, he made history when he made that uh, publication that he made with it. What, what newspaper was it again? Was it the, uh, uh, the Guardian? Is the it? Guardian yeah. is that the British it's newspaper British, yeah. came out essentially proclaimed as an insider, as somebody who had high, high security clearance, exactly what most of us knew anyways. It's already been disclosed in the past, but he made it public, and now the guy's on the run. He was in Hong Kong, and then he got flown to Moscow. He's supposed to go to Cuba. He never boarded that plane, and uh, I don't know if people know exactly where he is right now, but I wanted to get your, your insight. First of all, is, is Snowden, is he a hero or is he a traitor? I think of him as a hero because he's talking about abuse of power by the government. And when any, anyone comes out and shows that abuse of power, I look at them as more of a, a hero of liberty in the patriotic sense of the founding of this country as opposed to a traitor because he might have broke a law. Well, he did break a law, uh, but the law is very questionable when it comes to uh, people violating their oath of office, the Constitution. and. Um, I would disagree with the fact that he didn't break something uh, that, that was happening. I think a lot of us had speculated that this was occurring, um, but it was, I think, within even a year ago that 
the, uh, the director of intelligence, uh, Clapper, uh, Director Clapper, even said uh, that they do not do this. They do not spy on uh, people's metadata and uh, phone calls. And so, um, for one, he lied uh, under oath. And I believe in this most recent hearing, there was probably a lot of lies uh, taking place. And by the way, I think um, they even justify lying in those congressional hearings, those open source congressional hearings, because they feel that uh, they're trying to protect uh, data that's top secret, mm -hmm. and that's a very questionable program. Well, here's uh, here's something I want to show well, right now. Well, said uh, yesterday, he's, we're not listening to the phone calls. We're just looking for patterns. Harry, I don't have to listen to your phone calls to know what you're doing. If I know every single phone call you made, I'm able to determine every single person you talk to. I can get a pattern about your life that is very, very intrusive. And the real question here is, what do they do with this information that they collect? that does not have anything to do with al-Qaeda. There, 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 there's a whole deal when you talk about this kind of stuff where the, the, under the law they're supposed to demonstrate that they're getting rid of and not keeping any extraneous information that they pick up on wiretaps and or pick up in, 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 in sweeps like this. And the president's saying, I think I wrote down, he said, this is not mining or trolling. Mm -hmm. If it's true that 200 million Americans phone calls were monitored uh, in terms of not listening to what they said, right. but to whom they spoke and who spoke to them, I don't know. That's, that's, uh, the Congress should investigate this. So that's, uh, hey, President. that's uh, Senator Joe Biden. This is in 2006, and mm -hmm. he's talking about the NSA spying program. Right. Uh, he specifically uses the 200 million American citizen number, two-thirds of our population at the time, and saying that there is evidence or something that's known that this program is going on. So, you know, I just point that out to, again, show the double speak between the Democratic elite mm -hmm. uh, of yesterday when the, during the Bush years and that's of right. today during the Obama years. It's like, uh, it's like night and day in terms of their positions and the oh, messaging absolutely. that they're sending out. So right. uh, pretty frightening if you think about it. Oh, it is very much so. But that's politics and uh, you and I, we look at politics on a daily basis, so we catch the thing, these things, but messaging works in picking up those low information voters during election cycles that don't even pay attention to that stuff. So they can get away with it, and that's the sad part about our society is uh, they can lie and deceive voters into thinking that they're supportive of civil liberties when they really aren't. Mm -hmm. Which makes me ask the question, with all the scandals that have mm -hmm. been brought to light with all the infringements on the Constitution and on civil liberties with big organizations like the ACLU and other places uh, condemning some of these acts. It's, it seems that you know people have some outrage, but at the end of the day, they're just like, this is government, this is politics, this is how it always has been, mm -hmm. and it always will be. And hypothetically or theoretically speaking, Jake, I want to know is, is there some event that will finally break the camel's back, that will finally awaken the giant? Or is all of these scandals just to get us used to this idea of Big Brother, this idea of government coming down and basically controlling us? Yeah, I mean, when you really look at this in perspective, it's a trend that's been growing for the last 100 years, more focus on the central government, less adherence to the Constitution. I mean, from the day one, we were breaking uh, the Constitution. Even Jefferson himself was imposing taxes on some of these states uh, that was unconstitutional, and uh, some of his laws were even nullified. So, I mean, from the, the start, heck, even Washington, the first president with uh, the excise tax, tax on whiskey, um, there's always periods where the federal government steps outside of its bounds. So that's natural, but the progressive era of uh, Woodrow Wilson on has been really damaging to uh, both limited government and the framework of our Constitution. So I don't think it's anything new. What I would say is what breaks the camel's back is this economic collapse that I detail very often when we have a problem servicing the debt that we are, we've we inherited. I mean, we've had five trillion or six trillion dollars in the last five years added to our uh, federal debt. That's insane. And it's it's all financed at a low, artificially low interest rates, and it gets refinanced three to four trillion dollars a year when debt comes mature. So we're in a world of trouble once those interest rates go up. We can't make the payments on our debt. 
Plus we have programs like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security that continually grow and don't have the revenue to match it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to end our show here, we got five minutes left on, on a positive note. I was going to say, let's do it on a positive yes. note, right? <laughs> and this is, you know, we're both young guys. You know, I'm 34. I'm Leona and I, my wife, are about to have our first baby. You and Kirsten are young. We got our whole lives ahead of us. Oh. And there's a big urge, though, that things aren't always going to be like this. And, you know, what we can do now as Americans is to prepare for the new world, the new awakening that's coming. You look at great examples across our country mm -hmm. right now. North Dakota. Oh, yeah. Great. Open the market. No state income tax. Uh, they started drilling and fracking there. Uh, lowest unemployment rate, I think, in the entire country right now. And right. people are enjoying and prospering from capitalism there. Right. So it's a great example of how capitalism works and people are attracted to it and moving there for basically one reason and one reason only, and it's jobs. That's right. And, you know, you're seeing uh, innovations uh, come through in different types of technology that I'm pretty encouraged by. I just saw this... Uh, this flying bike, actually. These people in, that, yeah. in <laughs> Europe are designing the first <laughs> flying bike that you, that you actually just pedal. It's got some like uh, a parachute type thing. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd it, ever. It's go so impractical, like but yeah, it's the innovative juices going, and that's that's always helpful. Yeah, but I mean, can you talk more about like what you see? You know, once we get over this hump of of big government experiment and the whole thing well, collapses it, on itself, it really like, where are we going to go next? Yeah, it really needs to be political. Uh, so I still think America, relatively speaking, around the world and throughout history, is a free nation. I mean, I started a business a couple of years ago, so we can still do that. That's actually kind of rare in the in the tenets of history to be able to start a business. Um, but the uh, barriers to entry keep growing, and the reliance on government, the taxes that are taken out of the businessmen's hands, which is taken out of the private sector, continue to grow in this country where in places like Singapore and Hong Kong and even our, our friends up to the north in Canada are starting to go in a completely different direction, more market-based, uh, less government interference. Um, so right now, as far as the nation, you know, there's a lot of infringement on that, but state to state, you're right, North Dakota, Texas, places like that are really welcoming business and moving towards that. There's also something called a Free State Project, where uh, many people with from the libertarian, liberty-minded uh, persuasion are trying to move uh, and then take over the political landscape there and I think it's in New Hampshire mm -hmm. so that's an interesting project that would probably be I would say very beneficial yeah. but and I think my my thought is is moving forward we're gonna see, and you're already seeing it mm -hmm. we're gonna see it escalate even greater as the divide between the states continues and that's what federalism is in a way the vision for federalism which is a system we have is each state is its own laboratory, its own experimental environment where the governments can create the laws and the environment for business, for social programs, and the ones that are successful, those are where the people are going to flock to, and, and you're going to see people moving more and more towards the free market right. economies. They're going to go to the places where uh, the states that didn't institute Obamacare because they're going to have more affordable health care mm -hmm. and yep. more choice for the patients, and they're going to develop alternative methods of medicine and uh, with higher ratios of curing and and so you're going to see a great movement of people and it's not the first time that it's ever happened in america oh right absolutely I mean, there's right. always the westward yeah. expansion the depression made yep. people move all over the country to follow the jobs to follow the industry follow the economy and uh, really that's that's where we're going to go and and that's the end of our time here <laughs> for the tony hernandez show uh, we once again thank everybody for tuning in Thank our great loyal audience members. We broadcast every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. We also rebroadcast on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, may God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.